we're having the same amount of in raw numbers of gun murders in America in the era after the assault weapons ban was lifted as we did in 1972 when we had way less people. Which means that per capita, gun crimes were actually down from the 1970s. And so they keep trying to push forward this narrative that if you're pro-gun, you must just be okay with people dying. But the numbers simply do not bear that out. Hey, fellow tacticians. Be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. We're going to go ahead and get into argument number nine, which is how can you be pro-life and be pro-gun? Now, again, kind of like the first one, this is really just a red herring fallacy. Again, it's, it's just a argument that is designed to distract you from the actual issue at hand. And basically it, it makes the same argument that, ba you know, you have to agree with all of the things that I agree with in order to even start to talk to me about abortion. Well, that's a non sequitur. It has nothing to do with the actual abortion argument. I mean, you would not be at all inconsistent being both pro-gun and pro-life. And we'll illustrate that in a second. But even if that were the case, even if there were some inconsistency, that wouldn't mean that you were wrong on abortion. There are plenty of people that are inconsistent in their arguments, inconsistent in their logic, but they still reach the right conclusion and may be right about one issue, even if they're completely wrong about the other one. And so the idea is they're trying to point to an idea that this is somehow a contradiction because you must be very pro-death and must be in favor of people dying if you're pro-gun, which is a ridiculous premise really from the onset. Because it assumes that not only would people that are in favor of more gun rights are in favor of more death, which is just dumb on its face. There's not a person that's pro people getting gunned down in the streets or anything like that. Like, even if you believe it, they wouldn't believe it. And so you'd be attributing some kind of contradiction in their own logic. There would be no cognitive dissonance there for them regardless. But let's look at the actual facts on the ground is this actually a contradiction? Do more guns equal more death? Because that's the premise that this argument is predicated upon. So first of all, America had an assault weapons ban between 1994 and 2004. And it was one of the widest, biggest sweeping federal gun legislations, especially at the federal level. I mean, obviously there's states that do different things, but at the federal level, we have a pretty good indication and can get a good idea of how effective these gun control laws would be based on this gun control legislation that came through that banned all of the assault weapons, assuming that that's an actual categorization. It's not, if you actually know anything about guns. There's no designation of these group of, of rifles are assault weapons. That's, I mean, a baseball bat or my fist could be an assault weapon if I use it to hit somebody. That's assault. But regardless, let's not get off into the weeds on that one. But that is what the assumption is. And so, Based on that, let's look into that particular period in our country's history and see if being in favor of that gun legislation actually led to less death. So first of all, I'll just say right on the onset, there is no statistic that shows any discernible effect that this particular period in time had on either gun homicides or gun crimes in any way. And we're going to go through the numbers here for a second, which completely undermines the very premise of their argument. So back in 2003, the CDC did a comprehensive study on the effects of gun control laws and the effects of gun crimes. And this, by the way, specifically included, or sorry, this one wasn't in 2000. Oh, this was in 2003. So they were doing a, uh, basically a look back at exactly what effects the assault weapons ban had on gun crime and gun homicides and all these different things. And so let's go ahead and take a look at what they found in that. This is again, coming directly from the CDC. So you'll see there, the CDC says, uh, the task force found, the task force are the ones in the CDC that are orchestrating this whole thing. The task force found insufficient evidence to determine the effectiveness of any of the firearm laws or combinations of laws reviewed on violent outcomes. That's 
fairly conclusive. So there was no discernible change that it made whatsoever. And that's not me saying that. That's the CDC who put together a task force to study if that were effective or not. So there's, there's no evidence that shows that it prevented violence in any way. So the idea that less guns or more controlled guns means less death, I mean, just looking at it from the macro level, from 10,000 feet in the air, there's no evidence to support that, and that's according to the CDC. The study showed also that there was no effect on school shootings. First of all, that should be fairly obvious to anybody that remembers, there were still school shootings back in the middle of this assault weapons ban. For example, Columbine, which before Parkland was the worst school shooting in America's history, that happened while the assault weapons ban was in place. And so the idea that this, and it was right in the middle of it, so it wasn't like at the beginning, so you could claim that it hadn't really kicked in or anything. You know, this is a 10-year period, and this is, what, four years into that 10-year period? No, uh, actually, it would have been a little further than that, because 1999, um, that would have been uh, five years into it. So it would have been right in the middle of this assault weapons ban. And yet, it wasn't able to stop Columbine. It wasn't able to stop a lot of the school shootings that happened in the 90s. And by the way, you can look at it. That's not just an anecdote. Check out this stat, and this is actually coming again, not from a right-wing news source, NPR, uh, the government-run propaganda arm. Despite heightened fear of school shootings, it's not a growing epidemic. So NPR actually doing some accidental journalism here. Uh, read this. First, while multiple victim shootings in general are on the rise, that's not the case in schools. There's an average of about one a year in a country with more than 100,000 schools. There were more back in the 90s than in recent years, says Fox. And by the way, in case anyone starts throwing their hands up and uh, wailing, that's not Fox News. That's the last name of the scholar they spoke to. So uh, don't, don't freak out. It's not like they went to Fox News. NPR wouldn't have done that anyway. They didn't go to Fox News as their source. They're talking about the scholar that actually uh, did this study about how common school shootings are. Uh, for example, in one school year, according to this scholar, uh, 1997 through 1998, there were four multiple victim shootings in schools. Second, the overall number of gunshot victims at schools is also down, according to Fox's numbers. Back in 1992 to 1993, that school year, about 0.55 students per million were shot and killed. In 2014 to 2015, that rate was closer to 0.15 per million. So that means, statistically speaking, back then, you were about four times as likely to die in a school shooting. Now, we're talking about extremely rare events. The odds of you dying in a school shooting in the 90s were very, very, very low. I'm not saying that that was, you know, like half the kids at your school you wound up not graduating with because there were school shootings at every other school. That's not the way it was in the 90s. However, if you're looking at it by the numbers, these are still astronomically low occurrences, but they were four times as common in the 90s than they were in the mid-2010s. And that is a trend that has largely continued. School shootings are down. Now, gun violence overall has gone up, and we do occasionally get a big school shooting, but these are extremely rare events. And you're actually safer now as a school child in America than you were back in the 90s in the middle of this assault weapons ban. So again, this idea that gun control means less people die, there's simply nothing to back that up. America also had 16 straight years of decreased gun violence. Um, sorry, 16 straight years of decreased gun homicides from 2004 to 2022. Remember, that is after the ban was lifted. So you would expect if gun control really did stop gun homicides and gun crimes, you would see it decrease over the years of the assault weapons ban. Once the assault weapons ban was lifted in 2004, you would see a staggering increase in gun crime and gun homicide. But that is simply not what we see. The numbers do not bear that out. Let's look at Vox again. Not exactly a conservative news site. Vox, which is extremely left wing. Gun homicides, like all homicides, are down uh, from the 1980s and 1990s. And so you can see there, and they're using Pew Research Center as their source, that you see a precipitous drop in gun crime and uh, gun homicides death. And these are just 
deaths overall. These aren't even necessarily excluding things like suicides. And uh, look at what they said underneath. Most homicides in the U.S., 74.4% in 2016, are committed with guns. That is true. So it should come as no surprise that gun homicide rates have dropped over this period as well. Michael Plantley and Jennifer Truman of the Bureau of Statistics found that between 1993 and 2011, gun homicides fell 39% and non-fatal firearm crimes fell 69%. All right, that's a pretty big drop, and that's including the era after the assault weapons ban was lifted. It also says there was a slight uptick in murder rates in 2015 and 2016, but they fell in 2017 and appear to have fallen in 2018 too. So what's going on here? It looks like we removed the gun control and gun crimes and gun homicides continue to drop. That kind of pokes a pretty massive hole in the argument that if you just had gun control, that it would make people die less often. So that's obviously not true. All right. And an important thing to remember here, these are gun homicides, not gun murders. So that's including people that even suicided themselves with that. Now, that's a terrible thing, too, and we shouldn't discount that. But statistics have shown over and over again that if you're counting gun suicides, that greatly inflates the numbers. And if guns are removed, for example, some of the, the countries with the highest suicide rates in the world are ones that have extremely strict gun control laws. Take, for example, Mexico. There is the ability to own a firearm in Mexico, but there's only one gun store in the entire country. Gun control is extremely strict, although somehow all the gun cartels or, or the, uh, the drug cartels seem to find them. Uh, but the point is they have extremely strict gun control and they still have a really bad suicide rate in Mexico. Japan. There's basically no private gun ownership in Japan. It's one of the lowest gun ownership countries in the world, and yet they have one of the highest suicide rates, actually substantially higher than America, and yet somehow they're still killing themselves. They're just doing it without guns. And so the idea that the gun epidemic is somehow creating a problem with suicides is also not true. People will kill themselves in other ways. They'll just use something other than guns. And so it, but this is this statistic is counting gun suicides and it's still dropping. And so if you separated out the total gun deaths from actual gun murders and gun crimes, it would be dropping even more. And by the way, you don't have to take my word for this. Pew actually separated that out for us. So let's go ahead and look at this versus gun murders versus gun suicides. So you'll see that overall, if you're looking from all the way back in 1968 to 2001, that, you know, to a small degree, gun suicides actually are on the rise. But gun murders spiked in about 1992 and then took a nosedive. And you might say, well, maybe that was because of the assault weapons ban. Except the assault weapons ban goes away and it's still staying pretty low. In fact, it's staying pretty close to 1968 levels. Now, suicides, of course, are tragic, but America is roughly the middle of the pack on suicides. And so the, that doesn't really play into the gun debate or whether or not guns create more death at all. But from 2004 to 2014, murders are pretty close to 1972 levels. You're talking about 40-year lows, despite the fact that this is after the assault weapons ban was lifted. And in 1972, you have to also keep in mind, the U.S. population was around... 200 and looks like 212 million. So we're seeing gun levels after the assault weapons ban is lifted remain pretty close to 1972 levels, despite the fact that there was a 53% increase in population. This is not adjusted for population. This is just raw numbers. And so we're having the same amount of, in raw numbers, of gun murders in America in the era after the assault weapons ban was lifted, as we did in 1972, when we had way less people. Which means that per capita, gun crimes were actually down from the 1970s. And so they keep trying to push forward this narrative that if you're pro-gun, you must just be okay with people dying. But the numbers simply do not bear that out. Notice also 
that if we'll go back to this chart really quickly, I do want to point one other thing out. So let's look again at the gun murders uh, compiled by Pew Research. You'll see that there is a spike in recent years. Do you notice where those spikes are? They're in 2015 and 2020. What happened in 2015 and 2020? Because that's where those gun murders start to spike. Was that because lack of gun control was catching up with us? Or maybe it had something to do, well, I said 2015, I meant 2014. Because you'll look, it actually does start, start jettisoning up in 2014. What happened in 2014? The Michael Brown case, Black Lives Matter. So we see a increase in gun crime and gun murders when we start attacking our police officers. And then that same thing happens again in 2020. What happened in 2020? George Floyd, Black Lives Matter. That's where we're seeing the increases. This isn't because of our gun control and all of those spikes, I mean, by and large, happened in blue states and blue cities where there's lots of gun control. And so it actually had a lot more to do with the way that we were treating our police and the way that we were glorifying criminals and letting them off the hook than it had to do with guns in the first place. So I would say, I mean, based on the data, if you're, it's impossible to be against death and say you're for Black Lives Matter as an organization, Black Lives Matter Incorporated. Apparently those lives don't matter as long as they serve a political narrative. Also, this decrease happened at a time where the amount of firearm sales actually hit record highs. So again, this idea that more guns create more death doesn't really work if you're looking at the numbers. Let's go ahead and look at these stats from the uh, ATF and how many gun, because remember, this is the organization that oversees gun sales in this country. Look at how much we've increased from 2005 when it comes to gun sales. So we hit another record in 2022 where 3 million guns were sold in one year. So we're seeing massive increases in gun ownership. And there are way more guns in 2022 in private ownership than there are in 2005. We're seeing exponential increases. And yet, all of these things are happening while the gun murder rate is going down, with the exceptions, like I said, of around 2014 and then again in 2020. So the increase in gun ownership is not seeming to affect the gun murder rate at all. This narrative simply just does not work if you add even the slightest bit of scrutiny. President Obama also commissioned a CDC study of the defensive use of firearm back in 2013. And let's see what fruit that yielded. So again, this is Obama CDC. And their findings were almost all natural survey estimates indicate that defensive use of guns by victims are at least as common as offensive uses by criminals with estimates of annual uses ranging from about 500,000 to more than 3 million. Now, again, as they say in this study, data is very difficult to gather on this because it's a what might have been scenario. And you see pretty clear, I mean, when somebody dies from gun violence, you know that, that you can record that because there's a dead body with a gunshot wound in it. Like, that's pretty easy to record and track. It's very difficult to track the times where somebody used a firearm defensively. Because what happens if there's a, a young woman walking down the uh, alley, you know, trying to get back to her apartment late at night, and some guy jumps her and she pulls a firearm on him and he flees right away, she may not fire, file a police report on that. We may never know about that particular defensive use of firearms. And so this is very difficult to track, and that's why you get such a big range there. But they're saying at minimum it's 500,000. It could be as much as 3 million defensive uses of firearms. Okay, well, maybe that's offset by the fact that we have so much gun death in this country. I mean, surely we've got way more gun homicides than 500,000 to 3 million. Well, again, not if you're looking at the numbers. So let's go ahead and look again. And this is the same CDC that made that report I just showed you 
the U.S. population gun homicides in America is a little less than 20,000. A little less than 20,000. That's compared, and that's the highest number that I could find. So I'm trying to give as much benefit of the doubt as possible to the other side of the argument. That's the highest number I could find, almost 20,000, which means that even if you use the CDC's absolute lowest estimate possible for the defensive use of firearms, it's still 25 times larger than the amount of gun homicides we have in this country. The data is clear. Guns save lives. They don't take them. I mean, yes, a gun can take a life in an individual situation, but overall, the defensive use of firearms, private citizens owning their firearms and using them responsibly to defend themselves, which is their purpose, actually saves far more lives than it costs. And so when you get back to the argument that was really the, the genesis of all this, the reason that I showed you all this, well, how can you be pro-life and claim that you're a person that is a champion of life and be pro-gun. No, actually, I am pro-gun because I'm pro-life. Because having more guns in the hands of private, responsible, law-abiding citizens saves lives. It keeps people alive. And so not only is it not a contradiction, it's actually perfectly consistent to be in favor of gun rights and also be in favor of life, because that is how you defend life. <laughs> Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you made it all the way to the end, it must mean you like what you saw and should like and subscribe. That or you were just super bored, wound up here by accident, and were too lazy to turn the video off before now. Now, I hope you're the first type of person, but if you happen to be the second type, doesn't really matter to me. I got a view out of you either way. Huh. Profiting off of the laziness of others. This must be what it feels like to be a Democrat.